Hello and welcome to physics class. This is an introductory lecture about the science of physics. If you look up the word physics in the dictionary, you'll find that it comes from ancient Greek language. Literally translated, it means knowledge of nature. Of course, in this modern age, we like to look things up on our phones. And if you looked up Wikipedia definition of physics, you'd see it says something like this. It's the natural science that involves the study of matter and its motion through space and time along with related concepts such as energy and force. One of the most fundamental scientific disciplines, the main goal of physics is to understand how the universe behaves. The problem, for example, we can't control how the earth moves, but we have learned the rules by which it moves. The study of nature's rules is what this course is about. We want to understand the world that we live in. Understanding these rules adds richness to the way that we see the world, the way that we experience it. Let me put this course into context for you. Back in the early 1960s and late 1950s, the United States was in a Cold War and a space race with the Soviet Union, the main country in the current uh, political situation we would call Russia. Anyway, back in those days, Russia put a man into space before the United States. The United States was determined to catch up. And so it started pushing a lot of programs funded by the government in science and mathematics. Today, that has evolved into what we call STEM education. What we mean by STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We believe that we need to do a better job of educating students in all four of these areas in order to ensure not only our nation's economic success, but individual success. It can reduce economic and social inequality Now you've had courses in science and also mathematics. You probably already recognize that since you're in a physics course, there's going to be some math involved. And that's because the equations of math help us to make more compact and understandable relationships between various concepts, between what we call variables. So the methods of mathematics and experimentation have led to enormous successes in science. But my question is, do you know what technology and engineering mean? Have you had classes in those subjects? What's the difference between science and technology, for example? Science is all about trying to understand, trying to find knowledge, find facts and relationships between what we see in nature, and then organize that into some sort of overarching frameworks that we call theories to make sense of facts and observations that we make. Technology is the means by which a society provides its members with those things that it needs or wants. Technology can make use of science. Science can make use of technology, but they are not the same thing. You might say that science attempts to explain and understand the world, while technology's goal is to intervene in it. Both science and technology can use the same methods, observation, prediction, experiments, logic, mathematics, etc., and they both interact. Scientific discoveries lead to new technologies. New technologies lead to more scientific results. For example, back in the 1600s, lenses were improved and the telescope was invented. And the invention of that technology led Galileo to discover 
moons around Jupiter. And that was the first time that moons had been discovered around another planet. So a great scientific discovery. In later days, the study of the nature of light led to the construction of better lenses, which meant that even better telescopes and other instruments could be constructed. So in the first case, technology led to scientific discoveries. In the second case, scientific discoveries led to better technology. But there are differences between science and technology. One of the most fundamental differences is in their goal. The goal of science is generally altruistic. It's to understand and then to share that understanding with everybody. Many technologies can be beneficial. They can help everybody. But there are other technologies that only help some people. I'm thinking of things like weapons, guns, for example. It might help some people, but it might hurt others. What about engineering? How does that differ from science and technology? Well, again, let's turn to Wikipedia and find that it says that engineering is the application of mathematics, empirical evidence, and scientific, economic, social, and practical knowledge in order to invent, innovate, design, build, maintain, research, and improve structures, machines, tools, systems, components, materials, processes, and organizations. That's pretty complicated. Let's not write that down. Instead, we'll just think of the goal of engineering as being trying to figure out how to make things work or how to make things work better. Again, engineering obviously employs many of the same methods as science, observation, experiment, prediction, etc. And there's a huge overlap between technology and engineering. In fact, what you might say is that technology only exists as the product of engineering. Engineering is a process. Technology are its results. The bottom line is that science, technology, and engineering are all related. In fact, the same person may do all three or be all three. You can be a scientist, a technologist, and an engineer. Science, technology, and engineering are all critical aspects of our everyday existence. So we do our best to connect science that we do in this class with what we're going to call cross-cutting engineering and techno technology concepts and processes. In other words, while our focus is mostly going to be on the science of physics, we're going to talk some, maybe even quite often, about engineering and technology as well. So how do physicists go about doing their work? In addition to using mathematics and, of course, their brains to think things through, physicists have to use scientific methods. Other types of processes that I've already mentioned several, but please make a note that I said scientific methods. There is no one particular path that any given scientific study has to follow, contrary to what you may have learned in earlier science classes. For example, in ninth grade, you may have been given a scientific method, and it may have had a certain number of steps Observation leads to a hypothesis, which leads to an experiment, etc. Now you're getting older, you're more sophisticated. You can understand there's a lot more nuances involved. It's not straightforward like this. In fact, I like to think of scientific methods as being sort of a web with questions at the center. A scientific study might, in fact, start off with observation, but it might to start off because you were talking to somebody, you were communicating with another scientist. If you make an observation, then you ask a question. You might have to go and talk to other people, do communication before you start defining the problem and forming a question. So these things can interact and they can have feedback. If you make an observation and form a question and start carrying out a study, you may get other questions. And when you start thinking about them, reflecting on them and talk to other people, it might lead to other observations you have to meet. There is no 
lockstep method by which all science is done. And if you really think about it, you already knew that. When you were in biology class, if your teacher said, set up an experiment to show how fertilizer improves the growth of plants. Well, you would set up some plants where you put no fertilizer and call those the control. You'd have others where you use various levels of fertilizer and those will be your experimental uh, test subjects. You're manipulating things and having this control set. But if you were, let's say, an astronomer, how can you do that with stars? You can't touch stars. You can't set some aside and say, these are my controls and then carry out various manipulations on the others. Obviously, an astronomer is going to have to go about doing science a totally different way than a biologist. So there's no one scientific method. I want you to make sure you understand that. There are scientific methods, and those are what we want you to employ as you go through this course. So the process of science in general, not just physics, but it does involve these processes of things like observation, which means using your senses or instruments that extend your senses, like telescopes and microscopes and so forth. And you're using your senses or these instruments to obtain information. Another process that scientists use is the process of inference. And sometimes students get these confused. So let's make the difference clear. An inference means using your brain to interpret what you've observed. In other words, to figure out what it is that you're sensing. If you're not sure about what you're observing, what you're sensing, then you're making an inference. If you use words like, I think it means this, it possibly could be this, it may be, it could be this or that, or um, this happens because of some reason, you're making an inference not an observation. An observation should be something that everybody can agree on. For example, here's a young lady and she's touching something over here. So what are your observations? Well, I already made a couple. One was that this is a lady. We really don't know that for sure, do we? That's what we might call an inference. She's touching something because we see her hand laying on this what appears to be a metal ball. But again, that word appears means that I'm inferring it's metal. I don't really know if it is or it isn't. If you look really closely at this picture, let me blow it up just a little bit, you might be able to see that her hair is standing up. So we could say our observation is that her hair is a mess. What could you infer from that? Well, we might make an inference that somehow She's picking up an electrical charge when she's touching this device over here, and that charge is giving her hair static. That's an inference. So an observation is something that we can all agree upon, such as this thing is orange. Whereas an inference is, I think this is uh, a laboratory at a school. We don't know that for sure, but it sure looks like one, doesn't it? Another scientific method that all scientists use is the prediction. A prediction is a statement of what will occur under a given set of conditions. Again, sometimes students get predictions and inferences confused. The main difference is one of uh, direction and time. An inference explains what has happened, what you think has happened, whereas a prediction proposes what you think will happen in the future. You may also hear this term hypothesis. A hypothesis has a prediction in it, as well as some sort of proposed explanation for that prediction. So again, an inference says, I think this is what it means. A hypothesis would say, I think this is what's going to happen if I do this and this, and here's why I think that. So a hypothesis 
is a proposed explanation for a prediction, and it has to be testable. In other words, it tells you why you think you should expect certain results under given conditions. It's not merely an educated guess, contrary to what you may have heard in earlier uh, classes. A hypothesis has certain characteristics. It has to have a prediction that is potentially falsifiable, subject to rejection. In other words, it has to be, uh, you have to be able to show that you're potentially wrong. Now, of course, you want to be able to show that you're potentially right, but it has to be potentially false or else it's not really science. If you're always going to be right, no matter what you do, if you can never show that you're not wrong, you might be right, but it's not science. It's not a hypothesis. And so that's not part of our curriculum in this course. We're going to talk a little bit more about falsifiability a little later. I've used the word experiment a few times. An experiment is any kind of procedure that we use to test our prediction. When you design an experiment, you're dealing with various things that might potentially happen or that could change. We're going to call those variables. And there's two sets of variables that we're most particularly interested in. Those that we change on purpose, we're going to call manipulated variables. In math class, you might refer to them as an independent variable. It's the one that you change on purpose during an experiment. The results of a manipulation lead to responding variables. In math class, you might call these the dependent variable. In other words, if I do X, then I observe Y. And in fact, if you were graphing the manipulated and responding variables, you would put them respectively on the x-axis for manipulated or independent and y-axis for responding or dependent. So scientific methods are all these things that we just mentioned and more. If you hear the term scientific methods, it's a general term for any procedure that scientists are using to discover new information to substantiate claims that have been put forward. It includes also scientific theories. I mentioned this earlier. A theory is an explanatory framework for observations and physical occurrences. Scientific theories are not guesses. They're a big deal in science. This is the ultimate goal of science. If you want to understand the way the world works, you have to have these explanatory frameworks set up and connect information to them. Sometimes theories are derived from a number of observations and experiments. Sometimes they're just created out of a scientist's head. But just because you create them doesn't make them right and it doesn't make them perfect. What you have to do is test constantly over and over again and find out more and more information about whether or not your predictions are correct based on your explanations. Another term that we run into quite often are scientific laws, and sometimes people make a big deal of these. But I want you to understand that when you hear the term scientific law, or we just say law in science class, it's actually just a shorthand statement of what we expect to observe. For example, we're going to learn about Newton's laws of motion. But a law does not explain. It merely states what to expect to happen. A theory explains. The theory is what we're really going after. Laws are often just simple one-liners, one-sentences, or even just mathematical equations. Although many discoveries and advances in science occur thanks to these scientific methods, 
Other discoveries happen by accident. We say they're serendipitous. Trial and error experimentation and chance observations account for much of the progress in science, but occasionally people just discover things by accident. It's more about the attitude of inquiry, the idea that we're trying to under, under, uh, understand nature and uncover truth. That's what makes something scientific. It's not the questions, but the approach. One more term that we need to look at real quick is the term fact. If you hear the term fact in science, it means that this is something that two competent observers agree upon. So in science, what we try to do is take our observations and see whether or not they agree with what we thought we were, would see. If you find that your observations don't match what you expected, then you need to start rejecting that hypothesis and modifying that theory or abandoning it, abandoning it altogether. Scientists must accept findings even if you would like them to be different. So for example, if you look on the screen right here, you'll see these wavy lines, these lines that appear to be uh, kind of going at various angles. But if you actually make measurements, if I put two rulers up here, there's ruler one, ruler two, you can see that those two lines were actually parallel. So we need to abandon that idea that those lines are not parallel because the evidence shows that they are. Again, I want to emphasize that just because a theory gets set up doesn't mean that it's always right. That's the goal of science is to try to get better and better and better understanding of nature and to change theories as they go. So the refinement of theories is a strength of science, it's not a weakness. It's very important that rather than constantly trying to defend what you believed before, that you constantly try to modify what you're saying based on what you actually can see. I'm going to go back to that idea of falsifiability just for a few minutes. To determine whether or not a hypothesis is scientific, you have to be potentially wrong. You have to set it up in such a way that when you do tests, those tests might show that you were not correct. They may always show that you're right, and that's a good thing, but there has to be the potential for falsifiability or else you're not doing science. So a scientific hypothesis must both be testable and falsifiability, falsifiable. Obviously, you want to have ways to show that you're right, but you have to potentially be able to show that you're wrong. I'm going to give you some examples here in just a minute. Here's a hypothesis that's scientific. Any two objects drop from the same height above the surface of the Earth will hit the ground at the same time as long as air resistance is not a factor. So this is very specific. It says drop two objects of same height, they'll hit the ground same time as long as somehow you can ignore air resistance. This is uh, a scientific hypothesis because it is testable. You could pick up two objects and drop them and find out if you're right or not, but it's also falsifiable you might find out they don't hit the ground at the same time. Here's another hypothesis. No material object can travel faster than light. This idea may not be very easy to test because how do you measure things that are going at the speed of light? That's kind of hard, but it is testable and it is potentially falsifiable because if we ever find something that goes faster than the speed of light, this hypothesis is wrong. So far, we think this hypothesis is correct, but I gotta tell you, just in the last couple of years, the Large Hadron Super Collider over in Europe have had some results that seem like the objects must be going faster than the speed of light. 
And so they're really looking into that. Now here's some statements that are not scientific. The alignment of planets in the sky determines the best time for making decisions. That statement's not falsifiable. It's just a matter of speculation. You can't prove it wrong. How do you know if you made the best decision or not? Because you don't know all possible outcomes of any decision that you make. The hypothesis intelligent life exists on other planets somewhere in the universe. Sounds very scientific, but it's not falsifiable. You can show that you are correct if you find intelligent life somewhere, but what if you never find it? There's really no way to prove it wrong because there's no way that we can search every planet out in the universe. That's just way beyond our ability to accomplish. Here's a couple other statements. Our universe is surrounded by another larger universe with which we can have absolutely no contact. Again, that may be perfectly true. It sure sounds scientific, but there's no way to prove it correct. It's not testable. If you can have no contact with this larger universe, then there's absolutely no way that we could ever show that that hypothesis is, is uh, correct or that it's wrong. So just because something uses scientific terms doesn't make it science. So here's a few for you to think about and see if you understand what falsifiability and testability means. Atoms are the smallest particles of matter. Some animals live forever. Albert Einstein was the greatest physicist of the 1900s. In the first statement, atoms are the smallest particles of matter. That is scientific because there's a way to test and there's also a way to show it's potentially wrong. If you find particles smaller than atoms, which we have, then that statement is no longer taken to be scientific. It's, it was a great scientific hypothesis because it was testable and it was falsifiable, but it is wrong. And so we throw that out and modify our theory. Some animals live forever. That's not falsifiable because the word forever implies that we'd have to test this forever, and we can't do that. There's no end to your test, then that's not science. And Albert Einstein, was he the greatest physicist or not? That's a speculation, assertion on your part. It's a matter of opinion. There's no test for possible wrongness. It may sound scientific, it deals with science, but that's not science. A scientific hypothesis. It's not something that we can actually prove wrong. So this lecture was based on chapter one in the conceptual physics textbook. Hopefully you've already read that chapter and we're going to move on now to chapter two.